Hi, everyone. Welcome. Carl Steinbeck. Tonight I'm filming from my brother John's studio here in Texas. So thanks, John. John's not here with me, and I assume the technical aspects working good. I had to set this up myself, didn't do a test run or anything, but thanks to John, he's got me the same equipment that he has for his own studio here. So I didn't think I needed his help. So I assume you guys are able to hear me loud and clear. And uh, the topic for tonight, by the way, thank you for the mods, Private Eye Posse and also Roxanne. Appreciate your guys' help. So I haven't been on for 11 days, but I thought something I could talk about tonight was this issue, what Tar Harvey, excuse me, Charlie testified to in court. He said that he only told his mom after the uh, first supposed extortion, which I call a robbery, happened the uh, evening of the day that Dan Markell was shot. And so he said he only told his mom shortly after that. We didn't get the real specifics on when that happened, but he said he never told his dad. And he also said he never told his sister. And as you know, Wendy testified, she just heard about it that morning before she testified in court about the so-called extortion happening against uh, Charlie through Katie being the conduit. So what I thought was interesting to follow was what, what I do in like criminal cases, no matter what side I'm on, prosecution or offense, what I look for uh, for the key players is who, what did they say, when did they say it, and who did they say it to? So I want to know like the who, what, when, where, and why, all those kind of things on conversations with the key players. If you follow that in this particular case, follow it with like Charlie, for example, from what he said, you just find that it doesn't make any sense if you follow the normal behavior of people because what he's saying he's only told his mother and then he's implying that he never had a conversation with his dad about this so-called extortion until almost two years later where we saw him on the Matsuri tape and there's some little bits in there where we couldn't exactly hear what the conversation was it was muffled because of bad recording or, and background noise at the restaurant but we never saw him being startled or alert or alarmed or anything when the supposed conversation's happening and Harvey's finding out for the first time that there's this been this threat on their life and he's having to cough up a third of a million dollars. So that didn't make any sense. And then if you look at backtrack it to the fact that Donna is the spouse of Harvey and also the mother of Charlie. So he only told tells his mom and his mom's not going to go tell his dad. I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever. And they also have lawyers all around them. We know that the lawyer for Charlie called up right away when um, when there was a arrest made and asked to turn in, when, when there could there be arrangements made to have Charlie turned in as well instead of him being arrested. And uh, so these folks are all running tight together. They're all conversing together. And so for him to say that, on the witness stand that he, his dad never knew about it and his sister never knew about it. it was this it's so uh implausible and, and improbable and really quite outrageous and and ludicrous to think that they kept that a secret like this when all the other information is shared we know how much they they talk to each other and given that they also hired a lawyer we know from the uh from this what we've seen on uh, Roshbaum saying that in 2016, or I think it was around August of 2016, that's when he first was retained by Harvey and Donna. And so we're supposed to believe that Donna never told Roshbaum about this. And if she did, then she told him to keep it a secret from Harvey. So I'm just saying as also as a lawyer, you would be really in, caught in the dilemma. It's like, wait a minute, you're telling me I can't share something, yet you're both my clients and you're both married. So that doesn't even make any sense. And think about it. Harvey was a lot younger then too. So some of the concerns that people might say, well, maybe it was just to not make him get upset and things of that nature. No, this is something that was very critical. They needed to get lawyers. You're talking about life and death matter. Harvey was always the... Uh, sort of like the wise wise one of the family that would figure out who to get involved for lawyers and whatnot. He's the one that got the uh, the lawyer involved to help Charlie not get kicked out of dental school. So they knew to go to lawyers as soon as they were, they were caught with anything that uh, was unfavorable to them. And they obviously did that as well. And so for this thing to be a secret just between 
Harvey and his mother makes no sense whatsoever. That's not the way they conducted their their uh, personal affairs. Harvey was the guy that they sought out for wisdom and insight and also for money. So if you look at the money as well as what, what their uh, common method of, of communication was, Harvey was in on it from the get-go all the way. And I think that can be easily seen and uh, presented in court as well. He also is the one that gave up the vehicle for uh, for Katie to have that Lexus sedan. So he's got a number of things that he's involved in on this whole case. And think about the money. There's not going to be money coming from Donna without Harvey knowing about it. Harvey was the one running all the investments. He was the one totally immersed in their finances and controlling it, not Donna. Donna did some of the bookkeeping at the office. That's a different thing. You're not going to have a dentist uh, taking part in that. You're going to let and your office manager to do that. But all the investments, all this, the kind of trading of stock and whatnot that he was talking with his son, Charlie, about, those are kind of things that give insight into their relationship dynamics. And it shows that Harvey was definitely communicating with them about anything adverse that was happening to his family. So to think that the worst news that could possibly happen, they're not going to tell Charlie and the lawyer is not going to tell Charlie as well. And they're going to keep this from the lawyer or else the lawyer, so the other option is a lawyer would have kept this from Harvey as well. It's absolutely ludicrous. It makes no sense. Nobody's going to believe that. So if you just follow what they're trying to have the jury believe and how, how ridiculous it is, you just see how their whole story once again falls apart. So nothing they say makes any sense. The way they act, as I've said numerous, numerous times, everything they're doing is consistent with what guilty people do, and they're not good planners for a murder. They've probably never murdered anyone before, and so they've this is new to them, and they're relying a lot on Charlie for how it works. Remember, he's always saying that's not how it works. This is how it works when he's talking about how the uh, criminal arena works with regard to law enforcement and gangs and stuff like that. And so he's the one that they were relying on for all this so-called expertise, and he played them all for fools, right? So... In the end, this is something I think as a, as a prosecutor on, on the case, I'd be pulling the thread back, pulling the onion levels back, looking and really digesting and thinking about who was talking to who, what were they saying, what was the normal thing they would say if they're innocent, and what do we got to do to counter this when it comes up, if it comes up in court again, that uh, that Harvey didn't know about it and Wendy didn't know about it. And so it just it just really, I think, helps paint the picture that, these folks are lying about it and it, it builds to the strength of the prosecution case when they're ready to tackle that and take it on. So that's my opening comment for tonight. And uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and take questions. If you have posted questions before, uh, please go ahead and copy and paste those. If you could put the emoji with a, a couple of red question marks, it's a lot easier for me to get to. And uh, we'll go from there. Going to jump right down here to uh, the time, 9.57. Yeah, Charlie's take popping Xanax all the time. That that does mess with your thinking. So that's definitely something uh, I agree with you. Don't, don't rely on somebody popping a lot of those pills. Okay, Jill. Jane is asking, so Harvey, before Wendy will be prosecuted, no hopefully they'll be prosecuted at the same time. If they do this one at a time approach, I think that, uh, you know, they could go Harvey first to have Wendy testify like she's done for the other cases, or they could try them both together and they don't need Wendy's testimony. I've said that before. They don't need Wendy's testimony, uh, in order to go after her or any other family members. So the, um, that's why I think if they went after both of them at the same time, I mean, think about it. You're, if it takes almost two years to go to trial in any particular case, Donna's is going quicker than normal because she's because of her age and she wants to get this over and done with it. Normally, attorney's probably going to take at least two years on a murder case. And so if you talk about two or more years from the time Donna's convicted this fall, let's say she's convicted in um, middle end of October, and then you're going to wait a couple months before you charge Wendy, let's say, and then the attorney is going to ask for two years delay before it goes to trial. So you're talking about, you know, the kids are almost going to be out of high school by the time they get all the Adelsons rolled up. So I think that they should, um, 
move out sooner than later. Chloe's mom is asking, do you know why Charlie was moved? He might have asked for that himself. I don't know if he did get actually a threat. I know that he said he was threatened. I, I saw that there was something posed that Brees made a comment on Reddit saying he was, I believe it was Reddit, saying that he was uh, he was threatened and he had to be moved into administrative hold. And he has no visitors. He cannot make any phone calls. So that might have legitimately happened where he was threatened. I think that where he's out there, even at the Columbia Annex, even if he's in protective management, I think there's still threats that can happen there. I think it's still a dangerous place. There's no safe place in prison. And I think that the uh, the thing is also Charlie could be manipulating things. I think it's that way worse than where he was at in Wakulla, where he had those uh, former law enforcement types that were in the same area, his bunking area and living area. So I think that uh, there's always a possibility he's, he's sort of faking stuff to try to jerk jerk the uh, jailers around. So I'm not going to speculate on that, but um, <clears throat> it could be either or. So I, I just don't know. We don't, we're not going to have really good intel and even, even Brie could be played for that. Right. So we just don't know for sure. Law and Lit is saying Sigfredo's arrest affidavit said that someone saw him and Luis go down a path to a drainage dish behind the Trescott house, which is where Dan Markell lived, and they came back wet carrying a black object, money, or a phone from Wendy Adelson. So I don't think Wendy was actually there at the house during the time that they went before the, the morning of the actual murder effort. So... I just, uh, I do, I did see that in the police report. I'm familiar with what you're talking about here. Um, I, I'm not familiar about the black object, but I, I do not believe that Wendy would have met the, what met these folks. I know there's that testimony about she was walking down the street the day before. That's what Luis Rivera says. I don't know if it was her or somebody else. I doubt it was her. So I just don't know for sure, but that's, uh, that's always a possibility, but I'm, I'm not going to jump to the conclusion that she was there and it looks that incriminating if I don't, if I don't think that's um, necessarily something that he would have identified, maybe he was just saying that's her so he could, um, or Sigfredo saying that it was her so that he could encourage Luis to uh, go ahead and continue on in the plot because that's who they're fighting for and that's gonna, who's going to pay him kind of thing. So it could have just been that. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say I know any particular insight into that. Julia Nelson's asking if I think Harvey is called in Donna's trial. You know, I would I would venture to say that if he's not, that means there's more likely he's going to be prosecuted because they have that Florida statute where you can call somebody and as long as you do like a wall between their testimony and any future prosecutions, you, you can still prosecute them and just not use anything they say unless they lie about it. And here, any anything they talk about, it's going to be pretty much lies that they uh they're gonna get snagged and just like if you look at wendy's testimony each time she testifies it gets worse and worse as a witness georgia really went after her in charlie's trial really exposed her as as how bad of a liar she is even brought the fbi agent to rebut her testimony so i i thought that was a good move and they could even have done even more so to uh show that she's lying but they have not done so but i think they're going to keep ratcheting it up if they're smart Sarah Graham Burrell is saying, by if by chance Donna is found not guilty, what would the, be the next course of action for the prosecution? Will Wendy still be indicted? I think that uh, if Wendy would not be, excuse, excuse me, if Donna's not convicted, then I think they're just going to stop it right there. Um, and I think that would be a bad, bad maneuver. I think that uh, I just don't see the firepower and aggressiveness in the prosecution to go after more Adelsons. And um, I think it would be, wise to go after all of them at one chance uh that and, and try to try to have a joint trial with all of them and if you don't do a joint trial have them in very short rapid firing order so i just don't see that happening and uh she's not going to be found not guilty so that's that's pretty much uh a non-issue
SD is asking, have I, have I ever had to fire a client, especially if they're talking to like Charlie? Um, let me think off the top of my head. I, I can't think of any client that was like Charlie per se. I've had, I've had, I remember had a client ranting at me very loud and I had a, I had to put him in his place. So I, I tend to be very much confrontational with clients if they're, if they're making bad maneuvers that I think is going to hurt them. So I think, um, I think it's my responsibility to, to let them know if, if they're making something that could ruin the rest of their life. And, and I think that if I can get them to change their, their mind, then that would, that's a good thing for them to do the right thing. And sometimes they may not like to hear that. And sometimes they may want to see another attorney. I, I know that sometimes folks, when they're, shopping around for lawyers they want guaranteed results and as an attorney that's unethical and they'll tell me well so and so down the street and a different firm is guaranteed they could do such and such and i say put it in writing because you won't you can't guarantee that outcome and i'll do the best i can and even if i believe i could get that same outcome i'm not going to misrepresent that because that's unethical um but i have seen cases that are so preposterous and ridiculous that I pretty much say I, there's no way I can see us losing this case if I'm defending somebody. I, there's a, been a couple times like that, but I'm not making any guarantees like that. And uh, certainly it's not affecting any transfer of money between myself and the clients. All right, so looking for some red question marks here. I see you guys are doing some chatting along here. Let me jump down to the newest ones. Marta is asking if Donna's convicted, do you think that the, I'm hoping Donna's convicted. However, do you think the defense saying that she was just being a good mother because she believed what Charlie told her about the extortion would work? I would say that no matter what they try to do, they're not going to be able to succeed. And she's got her DNA fingerprints, you name it, all over this case. And I think her just trying to play the feeble old mother defense is not going to work and uh i think she's gonna be feisty enough in that trial from what it sounds like she's holding up pretty good there because there, she has a short window a short fuse between now and trial if she had to wait two years for trial i think she would start falling apart a lot faster but i think mentally she's able to adjust like that and uh be ready to go and so it's not going to matter what what she tries to present her present herself as and the other thing that, that's very key is you, you have to have a likable personality a lot of times to have a jury really buy into your story and whatnot. I just don't see her coming across as uh, likable. And so does that mean just because you're not liked that the jury's going to convict you? No, but I think it just goes with they're going to pick up on her personality, her aggressiveness, and all of her, the way she rolls her eyes. I mean, just look at the way Charlie acted in court. He acted like this thing's a joke. He was acting, laughing and joking, using profanity, stuff like that. I mean, that, that's all just cringeworthy stuff. Me as a defense lawyer, if my client was doing that, I, I'd be like, I'd be like lighting into him or the jury couldn't see it. And uh, he wouldn't, I would, I would tell him ahead of time, obviously, you, you got to be acting serious and can't be um, sitting there. I mean, think of all the times he's sitting there leaning on his arm and having his hand covering his face. And I mean, that's, that's not a professional way to look. Thunder Road Queen is asking if I uh, talk about why he's in admin confinement. I don't know why he's there. He, he could have been legitimately threatened, as Bree's saying, threatened it with his life. Otherwise, it could have been he's doing some kind of hoax, playing it on, playing some kind of prank on the jailers to try to get back to Wakola. And uh, so, don't know what the truth, ground truth is. But like I say, I'm just, I'm just not buying anything I hear. Whether I hear he got moved because somebody was walking along um, shortly after the murder happened, I, I just. I'm not putting much stock in any of those stories.
Yeah, I'm not going to talk about the likelihood of what her defense is going to be. I'm just not here. I'm just not here to help their defense, really. All I can all I was going to talk about is generalities that that I'm just telling you they're not going to work. Dinah Meitner is asking, other than just for speed, why is it best to try them all at the same time? How does it help the prosecutor with strategy and winning? I have, I've had other videos on that you can go back to, so I'm not going to go into this too much tonight, but just suffice it to say that, I mean, this is sort of like unheard of to have multiple co-defendants be strung out this much. And, uh, you know, one of the things you can lose witnesses, for example, if you're going to prosecute a key witness, um, excuse me, a key defendant and you don't, and you lose key witnesses because they die off or something happens or they get sick and they can't, can't be subpoenaed because they're too sick. And, uh, there's no guarantees that you'll have your same key witnesses available. And, uh, you know, the evidence generally degrades over time. Granted, some digital evidence might not, but memory, t memory tends to, and sometimes you can lose cooperation of witnesses. And uh, so you, you're gambling a whole lot. If you think you can have witnesses around 10 years after a murder happened and expect everything to be worked at working out with um, with a precision, you would if you did them all together. If you did them all together, I think what it does is it forces a, an implosion quicker of all the Adelsons. And uh, you have to have more of your ducks in a row. It's more of a challenge for the prosecution to be able to present all that evidence, but you can present all the evidence as sort of like the evidence against the family. And if you have that kind of family dynamics that you're presenting, I think it makes everyone see how they all work together as a family more. Cause when you do individual trials, you're focused more on that one person. Think about it for Charlie's trial. For those of you that have seen Charlie's trial, look at how much evidence they brought in on Donna, right? And even Wendy. They even brought in some evidence uh, against Wendy enough that they had an arguments. George is saying that George uh, Jeff Lacasse was framed. So why would they bring up evidence that Jeff Lacasse is framed? Because it was all a family hit. The whole family was involved. And so the evidence against one bleeds over to evidence against the other. And I think that's a natural understanding of how criminal conspiracies work and especially in a family where th people tend to be very much more in control of each other they're less likely to flip on each other and stuff like that so i just think that it's it's in, for my impressions uh, my my background i would have tried them all at the same time and if you're not going to do that you don't wait until one is convicted before you bring another forward think about it Donna, if it wasn't for that tip phone call to the state attorney's office, she would have been in Vietnam. They would have never nabbed her. And so she, she would have probably gotten to uh, United Arab Emirates and continued on to uh, Vietnam with Harvey. They would have never been able to prosecute her. She'd never be confined. And uh, so we, they were just that close to, to botching it against Donna. So that's that again supports my theory. It's like you don't wait around and and let these people live their lives and stuff like that. You go with the best evidence you got, and you don't wait and wait and wait year after year after year hoping something's going to drop in your lap better. But uh, if you start prosecuting them, you start getting better results. You get more of a likelihood they're going to mess up. So, um, granted, you can have some things sometimes turn out better if you do wait, like they have, like her having a chance to escape now could be used against her as well. So, um, but that's not always the case. And like I say, it's, it's more risky the longer you wait. So anyway, the evidence was strong enough years ago and think about it. If Donna had been prosecuted with Charlie, they both would have been convicted. It was overwhelming against both of them. So anyway, that's all I'll say on that tonight. But if you want to go back, like I said, old videos, you can see more on that where I'm talking about it. Tattletales asked Donna and Wendy and Charlie be in court at the same time. You know, it, it remains to be seen whether Charlie's called as a witness. And if he is, he's not going to be there when Wendy is sitting there unless she's a co-defendant at the defendant's table with her mom, Donna. So I think they're going to call Wendy just like they did the last time. They're going to do the same kind of stuff for that. 
Charlie, because he's already convicted, I don't think the prosecution is going to call him and it's going to be super dicey and high risk because the defense counsel calls him. If they're going to call a convicted murder and they say the way Charlie comes across so terrible, I think it's going to, it's going to really help convict Donna. So, and if they don't call him, he, he's the elephant in the room. Well, where is he at? Why isn't he here? And so it's, it's really a double-edged sword for their defense. And then what are you going to do with Harvey? Is Harvey going to be there? And, uh, you know, if he's not there, that's another huge elephant in the room. It's going to look like he's, he's scared because he's guilty too. And, uh, so there's just, none of that adds up good for the defense. Dreamscape is asking, do we, you see the divorce files being a large part of the prosecution. I'm sure that that would push Donna's buttons to make her relive each painful moment. Well, that's what they did in the previous trial. So that's what they're going to continue to do. I've said that, that they're going to do a uh, continuation of the same type of case they've done before with Donna and whatever new evidence they got from the uh, search warrants and also the uh, flight attempt, the uh, escape attempt out of the country, that kind of stuff is new since uh, Charlie's trial. So that'll be brought in well. You may hear some of the tapes of the uh, conversations that Donna had with Charlie as well. Debbie Martin's asking, can Rashman do a three-way call with Charlie and Donna? Well, they're they're listening into the calls for Donna. So if they do that, they're going to shut that down. She'll lose her phone privileges. So I don't think he's going to do that. And uh, whether they're monitoring it from the state jails, as much I doubt they are. But there's always a chance the state attorney's office could be listing that as well. So, <clears throat> all right. So we have here. Fancy is saying threat caught on tape. Lawyer is involved in meeting with Charlie. Okay, that's I don't know what exactly what that's about. Fancy, so do you not know the context of that? Lawyers involved in meeting with Charlie. Yeah, I don't. Is it his appellate lawyer or is it somebody else like Rashbaum? Don't have those specifics. Sonny from the H is saying, Charlie was a periodontist. Don't you think he would think he could get away with this? Yeah, absolutely. I think that was part of it. He thought he could get away with it. I think that the uh, the connections they had with the politician lawyer, I think that absolutely had a large part of it as well, that they thought they were good to go, that they could do whatever kind of strike they wanted to up north to, to rescue Wendy and get the kind of life they wanted. And it doesn't matter if you exterminate life brutally viciously they just don't care they live their life as if he just never existed and that's that's really how sick and cruel this murder was and for them to be walking around that many years it, it is very very much something that uh is an outrage Sir Tedrick Walker is saying, hopefully Charles will turn on Donna and Wendy. Do you think Wendy will be arrested right after Donna's convicted? I sure hope so. That's I've been saying they should have done it a long time by now. So they're just going really slow. They're slow method, but at least it looks like they're they're continuing on in their momentum and they're going to go after them one at a time. So Zelda Fitzgerald is asking, do I think they have any wiretaps on Wendy because they haven't been revealed? I don't think they did any wiretaps on Wendy. I think they didn't think of her as a suspect. I think she was cleared. If you could look at her interview with Detective Isom, it looked like she was cleared about 40 minutes in, and they treated her more as like a processed her as a suspect, but they didn't treat her as a suspect in the fact that they brought in the uh, victim advocate. So I think she uh, her, she played that to the to the exact way she thought she could with her with her acting skills and detective Isom fell for it.
All right. Earth Angel's asking, how do you make a red quartz? Yeah, you, you have to go to the emoji portion. It's actually an emoji. It's not on your keyboard, from what I'm told. I've never had to do one myself. Excellence is asking, will I do a special broadcast when Wendy's arrested? Yes, I will. Yeah, Lolly77, I agree with you, where she says, I so wish we'd go ahead. They would go ahead and arrest Wendy and Harvey. Yeah, just just roll them all up, get them up there. These are not the sophisticated criminal defendants that can outsmart the prosecution. Um, look, look at how I was laughing at the opening. I've been saying all along this case was a slam dunk win. There was zero chance of an acquittal or a hung jury. And when I saw Rashbaum making his opening it was it just confirmed everything and that's why i could laugh because it was like it was just confirmation that this this case was going nowhere for the defense and he was going to get convicted so i just think they don't understand how strong of a case they, they've had over these years so Julia Nelson's Nielsen's asking what age can the boys independently fly to Canada without Wendy Adelson's permission? Well, I, I think unless they're completely adults at 18, I don't think they can fly without her permission. Aza Jensen's asking, do you think Donna and Wendy could face the same sentences? Charlie, well, if they get convicted of murder one, it's automatically life without parole. So that's what Donna's charged with right now. Plus, Charlie got 30 and 30 consecutively for the conspiracy to commit murder and the um, solicitation to commit murder. So that's something that Donna would get as well. So it's statutorily mandatory that life without parole, the 30s and 30 could be consecutive or concurrently served with the life. Charlie got a consecutive. It doesn't really matter when, when you're somebody's um, like Donna's age. Spire JFK is saying, don't you think they should arrest Wendy either before Donna's trial or after her first appearance in Donna's case so as to rattle them all? Yeah, I, I, that's the kind of method I use. I, I use to, as much as I can. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them know that we're going after them heavy and we're not letting up and we're gonna we're gonna bring them all down and we're, we're gonna exude that confidence in the way we're charging them so the method of charging like i say does not exude confidence even though they should have confidence because they they did an excellent job against charlie um i, I, just, I just think that they didn't realize that they were going to do that good and the jury is going to come back that quick and they probably worried they had going to have a hung jury or something like that but it, it just there's just it's not that kind of piece, you have to worry about that. Yeah, on society page is saying, well, do a special live stream when she's arrested. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that has to happen. There's just no way they're that flat-footed down there that they're going to sit on this. All right, so looking for some red question marks here. Ms. Shayla Tadlock saying it's so frustrating to see how slow this prosecution team has been. Yeah, it's frustrating. I agree. I think that's what draws a lot of interest. It's gaining a lot more interest because it's taken so long. People are scratching their heads going, what is going on with this? Tattle, Tattletale is asking, does any agency check on the kids? Aren't their boys at risk? Yeah, I'd say they're at risk, but, you know, they're the agencies that protect children. They're swamped, and uh, they're not going to get involved in spot checks just because of a, a chance that when he's going to flee the country or do something drastic. Mm-hmm. 
Miriam Sandbrand is saying, but due to political connections, they weren't arrested. Yeah, that's what I've been saying. They had political ties to some some major players. Harvey's best friend was probably the best connected politician in South Florida to breach with breach back all the way up to Tallahassee. Joel is saying 10 years is too long to wait to charge money. Yeah, I mean, this is ridiculous. Like, this is a, they're treating it like it's a cold case murder. By the way, a cold case murder show that, um, that I saw a while ago, I thought it stopped, but it's back on. They got multiple seasons. It's called Cold Justice. It's on Oxygen. And you can even see some old shows on YouTube, I think. But there's a former Houston assistant district attorney there that uh is going around the country trying to help solve cold cases and uh there was one i saw that she was helping solve a cold case in chattanooga and she asked the prosecution what he thought about circumstantial evidence cases and he said well he said something to the effect of they can be harder to try but they also you can have in some cases you can have stronger evidence than than if it was direct and she was like she was like, yes. And she was like really excited because she was um she was same kind of thinking like I do. It's like circumstantial evidence you don't shy from because a lot of times it's you can't explain it. It's so good to and compelling to show the behaviors of people and um and that can uh can lead you to, to deductions and conclusions about uh guilt and innocence very well. And uh so and and she did in fact help solve that case and the person got uh convicted of second degree murder many years later i think it was like 10 12 years later and the statute of limitations was about to run out and that's why the prosecution there dialed up this uh this prosecution team so it's like her i forget her name off the top of my head and uh but anyway her and her investigator that come out there they were um they're realizing that the statute of limitations is about to run and, and and i get i credit to the uh prosecution team the chief prosecutor there they weren't afraid to reach out and ask for help so i think that's a good sign that if they don't have their eagles get in the way they're really willing to go out and get um outside opinion so they're not they're not missing something very obvious and sure enough by having that uh that cold justice team show up they were able to re-interview some witnesses and solve some stuff that the law enforcement before it had missed Chris M is asking, can the prosecution make a deal with Wendy to testify against Donna in exchange that the prosecution won't go against Wendy? Well, in theory, something like that could happen, but they're not going to do that in this particular case because she's they got enough evidence against Donna as is, and they don't need Wendy to go after her mom and flip on her mom like that. But on top of that, you have you have I would say Wendy's probably the primary target they really want to go after. Of all the Adelsons, I think deep down, I think Georgia wants to go after Wendy the most. And so I think that's uh that's what she's playing for. Remember, Wendy said they're not the state is isn't gonna prosecute me. And she was almost like daring Georgia to do it. So I think Georgia just needs a green light to go after Wendy, and hopefully she's gonna get that real soon. Fancy says she drove on Trescott three times with three different people. Uh, John and I drove on it just once, and it was just so obvious it's not a shortcut. And uh, that's why if the jury is taken on the route and shown the different routes that Wendy had from her house, the way she went on Trescott to go to the ABC liquor, there's no way anybody's going to find that to be reasonable, incredible. She was going there because no other reason than she know a hit was going down and she had to check it out. That is so abundantly clear. <clears throat> Teresa M is asking about politics playing a role. I, there's a, a video I did a few weeks ago and it had to do with the, um, the Weinstein. So if you look at that, 
you'll see what uh, politics had a role in this case. YB's asking, do you think the state needs Wendy to testify to get a conviction against Donna? I don't think they need her to, to get a conviction against Donna. I think it's helpful. Anytime you get a Adelson talking in front of a jury, I think it's a great thing for the prosecution. They're not good witnesses. They're not good liars. Their their character and their their um their ways come out abundantly clear and they could be picked apart and uh everything gets blown up in their face. So I would say that's uh, that's something I wouldn't be worried about. And the thing is, if you had a joint trial with all of them, it would be so it would be so amazing to see the pressure put on them to testify. And if one testifies, and if they all think they do so good in front of a jury like Charlie did, let them all get up there because every one of them that testifies, it just, it just guarantees a conviction that much easier. D is saying that Charlie said he didn't care much about Wendy's relocation, yet he offered to pay for over th a third of a million dollars. That wasn't pocket change to him. He was very tied to Donna, presenting as a handler of anything. Yeah, he did want to be a fixer for his mom. And uh, a third of a million dollars for him was uh, was not pocket change, I would say. But, I mean, he could, he could easily afford that because as a, as a collective group, they had, what is it, $8 million, almost nine million dollars and they're different investments and whatnot so it wasn't all from dentistry you're not going to make that kind of money in dentistry obviously but they had some kind of different uh businesses and things that they ran to uh to get all that wealth accumulated Just me saying, if Wendy opts not to testify using the fifth, can that be brought up against her? Well, the unique thing about the Florida statute is you cannot claim the fifth. And if you look at what Judge Everett was willing to do, he was ready, ready to have marshals go down there and arrest Harvey and Donna because they weren't cooperating with the uh, subpoena that they had issued them to testify in Charlie's case. So Judge Everett isn't going to mess around. They're not. She's going to have to cooperate. And she's going to have to plead the, uh, excuse me, not plead the fifth because if she does, and uh, Judge Everett's going to th put her in uh, lockup mode. Alex Perkins is saying, in my opinion, zero chance Harvey was left out, and here's why. Don't tell him about the bump. If Harvey didn't know, why would they say that, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, the bump is subsequent to the previous act. So if they're trying to say he didn't know about any of that kind of stuff, yeah, it's just none of that makes any sense, and it's not going to come across good at trial. Patricia S. says the state is, is it possible the state is working on getting another witness or two? What other reason for the long delays? I think that's just their MO. I think they have, like say, they made some effort to get some more subpoenaed digital evidence. I think that's going to help them. It'd be nice if they got some WhatsApp chat messages to present. But not sure if they, they ever asked for that and if it's going to ever pan out something because... Excuse me, the records probably aren't still around. But if it's on the cloud, they're probably getting stuff out of the cloud. That's probably going to be the most damning place to get stuff against these other Adelsons. Brooklyn Rules is saying, do you think with all this new technology, people think first for the off a family member? Well, you could say the same thing about any kind of murder. I mean, why would somebody commit a murder anyway, despite the fact that whether you could get caught or not? I mean, this is so such a thing that I, I can't comprehend. And so, especially a planned out murder like this, 
and you have such a privileged life and you've gone to all that schooling and have the licensures you need to uh, throw it all away and risk throwing it all away. I, I just don't get that. So, and despite the new technology, you still have people committing really, really stupid crimes like this. I mean, look at, look at all these wealthy people being brought up on charges now across the country. So no, it doesn't stop the, um, the hate in their heart. I think I see a little LJ behind me here. Yeah, Robin, I'm not I'm not going to talk about what defense might do. I'm not trying to help them. So whatever they try pulling for a stunt, I don't think it's going to work. Zelda Fitzgerald's asking, can we hear at the jail call of Charlie saying over and over, what are the chances she shows up at the crime scene? that's something that i don't see being brought in i think it's a very good point that they can make and i think that helps bolster their argument and i think that's something that is uh you know the like like he's saying that friend of his in detroit said what are the odds when he shows up an hour plus after the murder hit goes on and she's driving by the house the the house there where they um or Dan Markell got gunned down. It's way out of the way. It's like 40 minutes out of the way to get liquor. I mean, come on. So there's there's no jury that's going to buy that. So, so yeah, but I think that actual recording is not going to be admissible. But um, I'm not going to talk about why because I don't want to give any ideas. Then wrote... Thunder Road Queen is asking about any word on Katie's appeal. I have not seen anything lately. Okay, thanks, Fancy. She's saying the threat was serious. A lawyer went in to address it, and Charlie checked himself into solitary. Okay, well, if it's serious enough for Charlie to give up all of his conversations with his son and stuff like that, so maybe he's not trying to jerk the system around. And um, so that goes in line with exactly what I was saying earlier, that people were saying he's not going to be threatened in protective custody and all that kind of stuff. I just said, if you look at some of my past videos, uh, this, the one I had with John, where I said, look, the extortions are going to happen. It, he's like a purple unicorn there. You don't have somebody with his kind of background being thrown in the slammer with all these kind of career criminals and not have a lot of chaotic stuff going on and, and a lot of threats on your life. And he's not going to be sleeping well. He's going to be aging really fast there. Miriam Sandbrand is saying Harvey would always call in his connections. Absolutely. Har Harvey is not a, a guy out on an island trying to figure out how to handle a murder case um, when the law enforcement is approaching closer and closer to home. They're going to dial up their lawyers. They're going to try to sink everything and try to outsmart the lawyers. After all, they while they did think the, uh, the folks up there in Tallahassee are bump, a bunch of bumbling country bumpkins that wouldn't know how to prosecute them, uh, they started get prosecuting the the hitmen, and that that I think made them really make some maneuvers to not only get the lawyers they needed, but also to protect their assets. They got with CPAs and set up trusts, irrevocable trusts, and stuff like that. So they got very scared at that point, and they rightfully should have. They should have been scared all along enough to never do it, obviously, but. Yes, Sally A is asking, did you hear that Charlie asked for protective custody because another inmate was shaking him down for money? That's that's what we were hearing, and that's confirmed by uh by fancy here tonight. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Charlie, who's he gonna talk to now? If he's in protective custody, he has no one there, the guards will just come by, check on him, make an initial. 
of what condition he's in and can keep keep walking. So it it is very gonna very much gonna be something that's driving him nuts, driving him nuts. But for the him to be asking for that, it really shows the threat must be legitimate and serious. So I think that's um that's something they never took into account, right? They never took into account the fact that, hey, what if you get busted for this? What if you get prosecuted? What if you get convicted? What if you spend the life, your life in a, in a nasty prison in Florida with the most scary looking people you could ever imagine as your cellmates? Jill Jane is asking, can you explain again I know you have why perjury is so hard to get on hard to get Wendy on. Well, I've never said it's hard to get Wendy on. It's actually not that difficult. And contrary to what other attorneys said, even in Tallahassee, there's there's convictions for perjury all over the state of Florida every year. And there's even stats you can find on it. And I've talked to somebody that pulled the stats and I if I could present those stats, I would, but I, I don't have the technology capability right now. But yeah, there's 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 convictions in good old Leon County for that as well. Um, every few years, as I recall, so it's, it's not the rarity. And when you got somebody that's just not even admitting the most obvious in each and every trial, and she's lying to the extent you're calling the FBI agent to rebut, that's that's pretty. If you call that as a rebuttal witness in court, and uh, actually call the Markells to rebut to rebut the fact that she's saying that there was unfettered access to the kids by uh, Phil and Ruth. That's absolutely a, a falsehood that uh, would very, be very easy to convict on. I'm not going to talk about mental illness because that's not something that you do as a prosecutor. So I'm not going to talk about that here. I'm talk, talking about this from a prosecution standpoint. As a defense counsel, I bring up mental health issues of prosecution witnesses and stuff like that. And I'm always aware of the different DSM diagnoses and what the indicators are. And I use that to help cross examine folks or help come up with theories and stuff like that. And I use that for, um, like I say, for bringing up stuff in court. Cause I think a lot of court tactics and stuff like that, you got to use psychology. Janie Garner is asking if they are watching when he's coming and goings. You know, there, there's some kind of tabs on a, on her, perhaps, but not as strongly as you would think, is, is my guess. Yank Kanick is asking, can Dan Markell's family get with his attorney and file his papers about Wendy lying about her financial assets and be held in contempt of court? I mean, that was so long ago, and that's really not the contempt aspect they weren't parties to that that divorce proceeding so I, I just don't see that as being anything to gain any traction i've never seen the legal system work that way here in america and i don't i don't, wouldn't foresee it working that way in florida I agree with BuzzFeed print edition. Harvey would probably not nor ever was in the dark on what was going on this on this case. Yeah, here's a good comment by Jay saying, I'd never call the police if I was being extorted, yet Charlie extorted in prison goes running to the correctional officer. So yeah, um, good point to make. It just doesn't add up to showing any kind of semblance of sense what they were saying everything they did is aligned with guilt well harvey divorced donna for financial or legal reasons chris m is asking i don't see that happening i think they got everything in trust where they want them and i think everything's secure so they don't have to worry about that Teresa M is saying that Wendy's whole police interview is actually the performance of a lifetime that Donna insisted she needed to pull off in her email. Well, I thought it was good enough for ISOM, but I thought it was terrible. 
And uh, it was so, the more you look at that, the more you can really see that she's she's acting. There's no f genuine, sincere crying about Dan Markell. She couldn't stand him. He was, he was about to end her job, about end, you know risking her license and all that kind of stuff. So if there were, if there's any tears or tears of joy, <laughs> it's not my room it's john's room it's some artwork he got overseas <laughs> leslie ann is asking have you ever seen or read any of the emails when he sent in response to don or anyone else prior to Dan Markell's death. No, I have not seen those, but I think there's probably some that the state has. We just haven't seen those released yet. Matilda Yeager's asking about the grandparents' rights legislation. That's already been passed, so. Yeah, Beverly Lawyer is saying prosecution stage, sorry, mm -hmm. prosecution is still taking the sting from the Casey Anthony trial. Okay, the Casey Anthony trial, I have not watched the trial, but from what I've seen, they only went with murder one. If they went with murder one and the defense counsel is throwing up that it was probably the dad, Casey Anthony's dad, that's automatically a super high risk, extremely risky maneuver for a prosecution. And because you're bound to have some folks that don't think it's going to be murder one on a case like that. So them going for broke like that, they went broke because they made a very poor decision. And I would say it's not even the, the fact that the defense counsel was so great or doing anything like that. So it, it's just, it's just the way it shook out because they didn't have a good strategy on how to use the law to their benefit. So it's really a prosecution, um, prosecution dereliction more than anything great the defense did that's from what i invent so yeah automatically if you got a murder one case and defense counsel is going to point the finger at somebody else if you don't have murder two as an option as a lesser included offense then you're asking for trouble and so don't let that that should never scare a prosecutor unless they're going to do some charging um dereliction like that Yeah, so jury selection starts September 30th. The trial starts first week in October. That's the clarification. Marta Morales, I agree. The state waited way too long for their arrest. Zelda's asking, well, Wendy and Donna's experienced the same extortion prison threats that Charlie's getting. You know, I don't think it's going to be the same as uh, they get for male inmates. I mean, if you think about all the really violent criminals that you normally see arrested in any state in America, it's normally always a male. And so males tend to have gangs. You don't see really female gang members. You don't really see so much of the female drug dealers, although I've represented one once, but you just don't, you don't see the same kind of violence with guns and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you don't see like cartels using women to cut off being gang members cutting off heads of people and stuff like that so think about it. in these prisons you have some, some like really savage brutal murders walking around so it's uh it's a real scary place so i think charlie has had no idea um what he what he was going to face when he went to prison and i think he's getting a cold dose of reality now Jam is asking, do I think Harvey and Wendy are talking? I think very limited uh, uh, talking about anything having to do with mom or the case. She probably says, dad, I'll talk to you, but you cannot bring up anything about the case whatsoever, or I will never never talk to you again, or something like that. She's going to be very drastic like that. And think about it. Wendy's a lawyer. 
she could actually be a part of the defense team and go up there and talk to her mom anytime she wanted and not even during visiting hours and just talk one-on-one -on -one with her mom with no other jailers around. If she wanted to see her mom, she could do that. And you know what? She's not doing that because she wants to stay as far away from her as her mom because she knows her mom's radioactive. She can't go near her mom. Her mom's going to start talking and talking is what's sinking them. And Wendy at least has the uh, wherewithal to know not to talk to them like that. But what does that show about her? She's running scared she, and she should be because they all did this for her and she was involved in it. She helped set up Jeff LaCasse. So the whole thing is, is very much, um, still looking like she was, uh, guilty by her actions in this. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about what I was going through the minds of the kids. I'm just going to, I'll pass on that. But yeah, I, I think that's a good question, but I just don't really want to talk about what the kids are going through right now. But I do think that, I will say, I, I do think they've been brainwashed, definitely. I've said that before, but I'll just leave it at that. Now, here we have the Sidey page saying, in my mind, Wendy's already arrested. Yeah, in my mind, it's not the same. It just having that threat of law enforcement, I just, it's not the same to me. The satisfaction I have as a prosecutor is, is seeing that actually happen where somebody's nabbed like Donna was. Brenda Hull's asking, as an attorney, do you feel like Wendy was given immunity because she's an attorney? No, I don't think the attorney aspect has anything to do with it. Not at all. They would give that same thing to anybody. So it has nothing to do with the attorney aspect. I think the fact that she was having lawyered up and not going to cooperate with the prosecution and she had that statute working against her, I think that's what um, that's what forced her to have to come up there. She's not going to help testify against any of the, the hit men because she wanted nothing to do with this case because it's all about her, right? Tattletales is asking, did it appear when he appeared giddy during a police interview? It seemed like a weight was lifted. Yeah, there's different times in there where she's laughing and carrying on and just like you would never, if you took different snapshots like that, you would never think this person was crying, supposed, supposedly crying earlier about their her boy's father being murdered um, or in a murder attempt happening to them where he's not going to make it. So, yeah, I just, I just. Look at that whole interview, and the more you look at it, the more you'll see what I'm talking about. Wendy and Donna would not serve the same sentence in prison, Keela is asking. So, <laughs> yeah, I've not, uh, that Bengals had not gone on to that device behind my shoulder there. Yeah, Marta sees it like I do. Waiting for what? Arrest them all. It's I just don't get that. T. Hill's asking, does the prison audio and video record Harvey's visits to Charlie? Probably not. Probably not. I've never seen that before. I don't think they have resources to do that. Sunshine Girl's asking, do I think Charlie's continuous blinking at his trial with some kind of code to the person, example, Wendy on stand? I don't know that he was blinking any kind of code, but I've seen that before where folks do try to do a code to each other. So I just didn't see it in there. I just thought he was acting unprofessional, arrogant and cocky and uh, treated this whole thing like it's a joke. And he's got, it, he's got it in the bag and he's going home so he can just carry on any which way he wants. So that's, that's what I picked up on there. As far as his blinking at trial, I thought the real, the real noticeable demonstrations of lying for example were by wendy the way the way wendy blinks her eyes squeezes her eyes the way he 
way when he turns her face and stuff like that at different questions when she knows she's about to lie those are the kind of things that that were really standing out to me and something that a jury member would really pick up on Julia Nielsen's asking, who do I think was the architect of the hit of the fam? Well, I think I think that I've called Charlie the operational planner. I think Charlie was the one who said, I know how to reach the people to do it. And he probably told Wendy, you got to date somebody and be getting somebody jealous. And I don't care who you got to date. You just got to find somebody that will latch on to you and string them along and then dump them right beforehand. I think all that was played out by Charlie. I don't think Donna had that kind of operational planning expertise and anything like this so I, I think charlie looks as like a big challenge and how he's sort of being a movie director of sorts for this whole thing so i think he got a big kick out of it how to impress his mom and dad and and uh when he probably just said well you guys do this and keep me out of it and you know let me know what i need to know and then i think after the first botched attempt in the early june four to six june window i think they realized they need wendy's help to do this and that's why we had her smashing the TV for the TV code that 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 was hashed after the first botched effort of the hitmen uh, in early June. So I think she they had to bring her in more detail uh, in the planning aspects, and I think that was uh, at Charlie's request. So I think John is a real motivational driver behind this, and I think Charlie also had uh, Harvey to help finance it and give him guidance and stuff like that. So. <clears throat> despise icon is saying could the markels sue the prosecutor for taking so long no they have immunity from that kind of stuff so here in america you can't pursue prosecutors for that this is not my place this is john's place so oh, thanks to john appreciate that using all john's equipment here as well here we got somebody from melbourne uh, Carol Mitchell asking about will the Markel family sue when all this is all said and done? Sue Wendy? No, they pretty much she's judgment proof with everything in trust and whatnot. I just don't see that happening. Nikki News is asking, is Harvey likely involved? Go look at my video from a couple weeks ago. And um, so that's uh, something that I ought to. Uh, Fill you in on Harvey. There's a picture of Harvey on the thumbnail, and uh, I had there's a image there of a bullseye. So look for that. From it's about a month ago. So yeah, that was about a month ago, I think. <clears throat> so no, I'm not. Uh, I had a busy week. I'm house hunting, and I'm John's uh, letting me crash at his place while I'm looking for a house, and uh, along with three cats, they're holding up pretty good. Emma D is saying, you guys, I know the general consensus that we want Wendy to get her day in court, but something in my gut says they don't have the evidence to get her. Okay, well, you just haven't seen enough evidence then. So I would say the evidence is definitely there. People are not speculating. People are not out for just um, wild speculation or anything like that. So there's actually detailed concrete facts and uh, circumstantial evidence. So the probabilities of her having that many indicators of guilt are like astronomically more than one in a million. So it's almost, it's closer to having a DNA type of evidence, I would say. Um, me, Yo is saying, I heard Charlie will have a harder time after his administrative isolation because he has snitched. Yeah, that, that probably will get around that he snitched somebody out. And so 
that's going to be something that I think will definitely be hurting his reputation in prison and making him that much more exposed to threat. Thank you, Tennis Girl 101. Kelly Sigler. Kelly Sigler is the prosecutor I really respect. She's gone after many murder cases. She gets evidence. She knows how to prosecute it. I would really like her. I was thinking about that. I was like, maybe I should call her up and tell her to look at this case and at least make some comments on her or something like that. Or um, because she understands circumstantial evidence. And uh I'd be curious what her trial strategy would be if she'd be like me and go after all these guys really quick fashion, or she would uh, do the slow, slow, slow roll method that uh, we're, we're seeing over these many years. Teresa M is saying, as a teacher, I know CPS is very slow to act, even the most easily verifiable reports. So CPS, you're talking about child protective services, so that's going back to the boys. Yeah, Kelly Sigler from Houston. So, yeah, I'm glad to see her show still going. I highly recommend her show, uh, Cold Justice. And really, when you look at Cold Justice, what I see is like, first of all, law enforcement has to invite her in. They open up the books. They allow her to interview with her investigator, all the different folks that, as witnesses. And they really, it's really, they have to humble themselves like i said before to, to be willing to go to that measure to allow somebody on the outside it, to have the potential to embarrass them and say this is what you miss so but it shouldn't be about pride or ego when you're going after justice it should be about let's go after the let's get the best team we can possibly have to go after this if we don't think we can bring down the killer if, if it's still a whodunit kind of thing Tattletales is asking, can they make Wendy testify against her mother? Yes, they can under that state law. She's been brought in and forced to testify against her brother and as well as Katie, as well as against the hitman, Sigfredo. Yep, great show. Kelly doesn't mess around. Yep. That's okay. I'm not worried about any naysayers. I'm not worried about naysayers. So I wouldn't be wasting my time on this if I thought it was sketchy. Lemon Bake is asking if I'll cover the Corey Richens case. Looks like the mom is involved too. It's similar to the Adelson case. Hmm, I've not heard that about the mom being involved. That's interesting. I wasn't planning on looking at that one, but maybe maybe I should after you make that comment. Yeah, Jeannie, the crime junkie is asking if any if they gave anyone a deal, I would not want it to be Wendy. Yeah, I don't I don't think they're gonna do that. Andy Lee's asking who makes a decision to charge, Georgia or Jack. I think on a murder case, Jack has to get the um, final say on that. They're not going to go after somebody on a murder case like Jack okay in it. Or him preventing them from going after him, if that's the case. But I think he's going to allow them to go after Wendy. It's just going to take longer. Sir Tedrick Walker is asking, why is there a statute of limitations? I would think that you should be able to prosecute any crime with evidence without limits. Some of those statute of limitations have been changing in recent years here in America and different states for civil proceedings, some also in criminal proceedings as well. And um, I think it's just a matter of fundamental fairness because they don't want to have any crime of any degree having something that can come back and somebody can say something happened to me many many decades ago and then they that can come out and uh and ruin that person's life because they got to go through a trial and defend themselves if it's a murder case obviously murder never has a statute of limitations but if it's like in tennessee they had, did have a statute of limitations for a second degree murder i think it was like 15 years from the uh date of uh knowledge of who the uh per perpetrator was that they're going after so I don't, I'm not in agreement with the 15 years for secondary murder. I think that should also be something that um, 
never has a limitation. All right, I'm about a half hour behind here on questions. Chloe's mom is asking, did I move? Yes, I did move. No longer in Tennessee. Mel Von Monkers is asking, when he sent Charlie, a text to Charlie the morning of the murder saying, this is so sweet, what do you suppose that Wendy meant? I think it had to do with the fact the guys were supposed to be showing up that morning. So, yep, that's what I think it was about. Thunder Road Queen is saying, if they can indict a ham sandwich, what's going on with Wendy and Harvey? Yeah, I mean, an indictment is very easy to get, but you don't want to just do an indictment. You want to get the actual conviction, but there's enough for both. And uh, so, yeah, it is It is very much, you know, a great thing to see Charlie convicted. It's very great to see them going after, going after now Donna. But at the same time, it's like, gosh, what's taking so long with Wendy and Harvey? All right, somebody else from McKinney. Nice. Teresa M is asking, I know politics played a role in the past and watch your show. I wonder if it still is a, playing a role. Maybe it's a moot point. I think it's it's dying on the vine. And so I don't think it's carrying the weight it did before. So I think they'll be able to go. I, I think if there's any politics that would stop any from being arrested would be probably Donna because Donna's close with the Weinsteins and so as well as Harvey so I think their political connections have uh are not able to stop them from being arrested at this point I think it's more about them just being overly cautious and guarded in the state attorney's office we've already talked about uh solitary confinement Catalina and uh the word we got is that he would, there was a legit, legitimate threat made against Charlie such that he had to report it and he took it credible enough. He even had an attorney show up and I guess there's some kind of, must be some kind of inquiry going on. He's in solitary confinement. He can't talk to witnesses, excuse me, uh, any visitors. Um, and he cannot have anybody on the phone talking to him other than attorneys. So... That's what's going on with that. Miriam Sandbrand is asking, what did Harvey think he was doing when he and Donna drove to Charlie's house with stable cash? Yeah, I think that, you know, they didn't think about any idea that this would be traced back to him in Miami. They thought this was the perfect murder they planned. D is asking, what was the number one strongest prosecution comment moment in your opinion when Georgia reread the name calling email and Charlie snickered? I thought that was a single worst moment. That's a good question. Wow. Yeah, that one, that was one. I think of his behavior. I think when Georgia said the F word that uh called him an F word, that I think that's uh, when she said that to Wendy and I think Wendy tried dodging that and she said, I don't remember that, but yeah. Okay. When she said it, then she goes, yeah, that might have, that sounds, it might be right or something like that. And Charlie was sort of snickering like, come on, Wendy, you know, she said it a lot kind of thing. And so, yeah, that kind of behavior, I just think it was very cringe worthy as a, as a defense counsel, I was, I was be very cringe, cringing over my client acting that way in front of jury. So I think that there was a, uh, Gosh, there were so many moments like like that, though. The uh, you know the whole time he's sitting there like this and just sitting back and snickering and laughing a lot of the times, and he just he just doesn't take it serious. I mean, his whole demeanor the whole time was, "I do not take this serious. I'm out of here." And he even made some, some cocky statement like, 
like when he gets out of there, when he goes home, I, I can't remember the exact words he used, but I mean, that was so insulting to the jury to say that. And then I think also the, um, the, the aspect that, uh, what was that that was said about, um, I think there was a number of single females on the jury when, when he mentioned that basically a single mother with kids, nobody is interested in, I mean, to make, make that kind of a crude comment and uh condescending comment that, that really came back to bite him. And uh, so, yeah, there's, there's a number of things we could go on and, and rehash that, that were all just really daggers against Charlie. So, but I think overall, it was just a nonstop. There were so many of them. I think it's overall like the cumulative effect was just, it's just crushing. It just crushed his case, his whole demeanor. And um, I mean, that whole thing about this being an extortion plot and any, everything. I mean, as soon as that was brought up in the opening, I mean, that was like, okay, game over. This thing is so ridiculous. Stick a fork in it. It's over. <laughs> Peter Strata liked it when I said always a good time whenever Nadelson takes a stand <laughs> he'd put that on a t-shirt and books yeah I mean that's what I'm saying the prosecution they were they're were worried about these high and mighty wealthy defendants that they never see I mean think about it. they're used to trying poor people poor people get tried with all these violent crimes it's not the rich people for the most part it's sort of Changing and changing across America now, as I mentioned earlier, but yeah, it's just really bizarre that uh, the prosecution didn't have the uh, confidence to go after him earlier. Society page is saying Charlie Clooney did wealth by doing unnecessary dental work. Well, I think that that did was the case as well. Because as a periodontist, you're doing like stuff that's ripping teeth out and crushing up bone that's attached to the teeth and stuff like that. It's really complex stuff. So apparently he's able to build a lot more from that. But I do know that there's a lot of other investments. I think they have like, what is it, 15 rental units and stuff like that. And so they were also playing the stock market and trading a lot and stuff like that. So. Yeah, Caroline C. saying they had $9 million, but Wendy couldn't afford a house in Tallahassee. Yeah, why didn't they just buy a house there and uh, for her and also for them to go visit instead of doing this murder thing? Wow. Neely saying, why does Wendy lie about living at the Continuum high price condo? She testified she lived at Coral Springs. Yeah, that that's something else that they could rebut. Um, when she testifies again, I mean, maybe she was at one during the week and then the other one on a weekend or something like that, but they never quite nailed it down, but definitely there's some evasiveness there, I believe. Yeah, prison is not going well for Charlie. Think about how easy he had it in jail up there in Leon County Jail compared to uh, prison. Okay, Jay, this is what I've heard before. I've not seen this, but there was an interview of one of the jurors in Katie's trial that said they'd have no problem convicting Wendy with just the evidence that came out of Katie's trial. Jurors thought Wendy was horrible on the witness stand. I have not seen that. I've just heard people re reporting that, so it must be an accurate report. So I think that um, that just goes to show that, that what I've been saying all along is that it's not that hard to go after these Adelsons. It's, it's not this giant mountain to have to, to uh, climb like Mount Everest or something where you just Hey, don't really think you can have a, sh a shot at all to make it over the top. It it's really not that tough. These people will fall all over themselves. They botched this whole murder plot. What makes you think that they're going to be able to make it look like they had nothing to do with this? Catalina is asking, what 
the law is broken of when he doesn't testify as a contempt of court. Yeah, I'd be contempt of court. And she'd be jailed until she agrees to cooperate for up to six months at a time. Baby doll, yeah, for those of you, go back and look at Wendy, once you testify in front of Judge Hankinson, um, that great judge when uh, that has since passed on. Remember she said that she didn't know how to spell gibbers and she played dumb in that, dumb with that. And the judge actually asked the question, like, how do you spell that? And she's, she said she didn't know. And then Georgia got her good because she said, isn't it spelled J-I-B-B-E-R-S in, in your phone for, for Dan Markell's phone number? So busted big time on that. Okay, I mean, somebody's saying LJ. Oh, that's already. Sir Tedrick Walker's asking if the co conspirators all had burner phones. They might have, but they sure were using their regular phones a lot, which is really surprising. Yeah, they, they were using WhatsApp and stuff like that, I'm sure, but they I think they're using all three. All right, I'm still behind here. I'm at 10th or now. I'm, I'm, well, I'm way behind. Sorry about that. I'm trying to answer questions as they come in, but I'm getting caught up here. No, they won't send Wendy and Donna to the same prison for moral support. They, they'd make a point of keeping them separate. Serge Deb is asking, how long will the Charlie Bill stay in the administrative segregation? I've saw somewhere that's like 30 days where he's there but and then they do a review so he could be there for a long time he's really worried that much worried about somebody killing him i mean think about it. if you if you have a threat against your life how are you going to sleep at night thinking that you're not safe anywhere in that prison because somebody else could be connected to the person that put a hit on you uh put the threat on you and you're not going to be able to sleep even at night so that's why you just just to have a chance of even sleeping at night you're going to want to be isolated yes sir tedrick walker is saying many hardened criminals are who are rejected by their gangs in prison go into protective custody so hardened criminals surround charlie in protective custody yeah, they're not going to be they're not going to be the weak and timid there necessarily. So yeah, they can be they can be having a gang history as well and, and a real history of violence and stuff like that. So Right, I'm with 10.45 here. Yeah, Colonel Mitchell, why in Wendy's police interview was she shopping uncontrollably over a man she hated? Well, it wasn't all uncontrollably, and I don't think she was really crying. I think if there was any tears, I think there were tears of joy, so... Somebody's asking what I was laughing at. I was last, laughing at somebody, somebody's comment about the lamp behind me. That's probably what I was laughing at. Um, they call it a mad scientist laugh. Uh, laugh lamp, that's why I was laughing. Yeah, all right, somebody. Yeah, Cheryl Crawford's asking, will they change venue? I assume you're meaning for Donna. No, they won't change venue. It's very hard to get in Florida. There's not enough knowledge of this case out there. They'll, they'll be able to pick a jury for her. 
Zelda Fitzgerald's asking today, I think Wendy's calm or freaking out or taking lots of Xanax. I think she's taking a lot of Xanax and things like that. Tennis girls asking, is there any much of a chance Georgia has calls between Donna and Wendy that we have not heard that will incriminate them both? Well, that would be only be heard through, I'd say, wiretap. I don't think we're going to have Wendy talking on any of the jail calls. So I, I don't think we're going to have any wiretaps of that nature. I think if there's what, WhatsApp or Snapchat they're able to get, then that would be something uh, through messages. But I don't think you're going to have any verbal calls. Andrew's asking about jail calls from Donna. Yeah, there's been jail calls from Donna making a different folks, but we don't we've not seen any release of those audios since she's been arrested. I know uh True Lifestyles has posted stuff on stuff that uh who she's been talking to and she's talked to Rosh Bomb a couple times a week for a couple hours at a time. That was a couple weeks ago last I had heard. That new attorney she has, Alex Morris, he's been there a few times a week as well. Hannah Day is asking, will it be definitely Georgia prosecuting Donna or will it, could it be another state prosecutor? I think it's going to be the same team. I, I think this case has enough complexities. They don't need to risk it by having a different prosecution team. Society page, I agree with you when you say Wendy barely looked at Charlie while she was on the stand. That's what I recall, that she really did not pay him much attention at all. And I think that um, that also is something the jury picks up on. If Wendy's convicted, could Dan's insurance carrier sue Wendy to cover any benefits paid? Well, the benefits were paid for the for the boys care and so wendy is getting it as a caretaker of the kids she wasn't actually the designated beneficiary after the divorce so technically i don't think that's possible Tattletail is saying, Wendy said it in motion. She's a maestro. Yeah, I think she really knew how to play her family to her advantage. Totally. Yeah, so we got, uh, let's see. Chris, I'm asking, could Donna get convicted of a lesser crime like accessory after the fact? I don't know if they have that as a lesser included offense for murder one or not. In, um, and they probably won't have that kind of instruction because I think there, there's enough evidence there to go after her for, for the other ones like conspiracy and solicitation. So I, I'm not worried about that. But... Um, And I'm not sure if that would be a lesser included in Florida. Carolina is asking if Wendy goes to trial, would the jury be able to watch the police interviews of Wendy, Tamara Demko, and Jeff Lacasse? And I would say no for Jeff Lacasse, no for Tamara Demko. Unless there's something like impeachment or something they want to bring out, but I don't see that being a possibility. And uh, for Wendy, please interviews for Wendy going to trial. Absolutely. Those kind of things will be brought in. They'll bring in as much as they can on her interview. And I think that's very helpful to the prosecution. So, yeah, I see that happening. But there, she's hopefully they'll bring Jeff like they have. I'm sure they'll bring in Jeff. But they have missed out on bringing Tamara Demko. So I think that would be wise of them.
Caroline C, I agree with you. If Wendy was innocent, she would testify honestly. Carol Tell is asking, can Donna, when she's on trial and takes a stand in her own defense, take the fifth on every question <laughs> after all that's said and done? Can the Markell family sue the Adelsons? Uh, they already got everything protected to uh, much in trust. And if somebody gets on the witness stand <laughs> in their own defense and they plead the fifth to all the questions, I, uh, that's I've never seen that happen before, and I don't think that would happen. And I would think that's definitely game over for the defense if they tr tried that on. And yeah, there's definitely more evidence out there we haven't seen. Andrew's asking, what mistakes did Charlie, uh, excuse me, Dan Rushman make in Charlie Adelson's trial? Well, I've said that, you know, there's a lot of different stuff, strategies and tactics that that I would have recommended somebody do differently if I was his coach, but I, I don't really want to get into coaching him how to be a better attorney. I, I have said before in his defense, he had nothing to work with and um, very boring opening, very boring closing, went way too long. Those kind of things I've said before, but those are just, um, those are the things he felt he wanted to do. And that's what he, what Charlie was happy to see. So, I guess uh, Charlie was satisfied with it. And uh, no, LJ's here showing up. Jill Jane, you're asking about when he's immunity. Basically, she has immunity from things she says in that trial, each trial. They can't be used against her. Again, unless she's committing perjury. So they can't, in her own trial, when she's being prosecuted for murder, they can't bring what she set up in those other trials, any of it up, unless it's contradicting what she says in her own defense when she's on the stand. Unless they also um, charge her with perjury, then any of those statements that she lied about, all that kind of stuff can come in. So that's, that's what it has to do with. So it's not immunity to being prosecuted for for murder one like the other family members. Yeah, Body Heat, I've not seen that movie. Yeah, if Jane Blackford agrees, we'd love to hear Kelly Sigler's opinion. Okay, Tennis Girl saying I should give her a call. Okay, I might do that. I don't know if she how she's reachable, but uh, let's see here. What else we got? All right, steampunk. I didn't know that Jeffrey Jordan is saying that uh, lamp behind me. Okay, cool. Sunshine Girl's asking, when he didn't change her last name to Markell when she married Dan Markell, do you think that was just another way to hurt him? No, I don't think so. I think there's a lot of professional couples that the, the female spouse keeps their maiden name and they never adopt the other, the husband's last name. They have diplomas and stuff in, in their maiden name and stuff like that. And I think there's always keep that name. Maybe they'll add it sometimes the husband's last name but i don't i don't look at that as anything as a dig could it have been one yes but i just didn't think it was and at the time supposedly they, they got along really good so i think i think it was just her mind that she was gonna she's just gonna keep her main name as is all right so let's see Aza Jensen is asking, do I think Wendy's nervous or feels invincible? Well, I think she felt invincible the first two trials. I think at this last trial, I think she really, the wheels came off. I think she was really rattled. I think Georgia let her know, we got your number. And I think Georgia really was able to bring up some of her lies. And um, I think Wendy just left that courtroom realizing that, uh, that she came across terrible and um and i believe i've heard that somebody overheard 
her attorney tell her in the parking lot, you did terrible on that witness stand or words to that effect. So apparently her own attorney has the same opinion I do of her testimony. So how's that for you? <laughs> Yeah, Riley H. I've been saying that all along. Charged with perjury. Absolutely. Should be charged with perjury. Definitely. Ultimately, it's up to uh, Andy Lee's asking who's the ultimate decision charge when you're not. It's going to be Jack Campbell. And I don't think he's going to be a guy that uh, wants to have that as his legacy. He was the guy that was too afraid to take on all the Adelsons. Yeah, this is you guys are some of you guys are chatting about this being a movie. This um this murder case um by the Adelson family. It's gonna have to be a multi part multiple part series because there's a lot of details and they're gonna miss a lot of details in this case that are really really something that makes I'd say a normal murder case you see on any of these true crime shows. I think it makes this those cases pretty boring. I've heard I've heard folks saying that. So yeah, this is this is the most bizarre case I think you could ever possibly come across. If there's another worse bizarre case to to have to uh, to digest, I I'd like to see it. There's so many so many issues of minutia to to go down to to prove up the case against uh, against the whole family, not necessarily so much against Charlie and Donna. Those are the easier pickings, but think going after more of the details like you need for wendy they're there you just got to have a prosecutor that uh, understands how to process that kind of evidence in front of a jury Yeah, Andy School is saying that Kelly's had some misfortune when the show has departed. Someone above the DA has squelched, I believe, 13% of the cases agreed to be tried without explanation. Other times the DA's decline when cameras are, uh, are out. But I would say that I followed up on that one for Chattanooga because I was I was concerned about that as well. And that one, like I said, got convicted of second-degree murder. They went to, took it to trial. So that one they followed up on. So, yeah, I'll start looking at when I have some more time down the road. I'll start looking at some more of those cold justice shows and uh because you can google the name of the defendant and actually see what happened so mk villa verde is saying harvey knew about every cent the family had he knew yeah absolutely you're not going to part with a third of a million dollars and not know where it's going to who's it going to and what's your roi return on investment So yeah, you guys can go back and look at that video I mentioned earlier. Some of you guys are joining late here. Video about the extortion plots that John and I did. And uh, we did it, I think, last summer. And that'll talk to you, tell you about some of the stuff that I anticipated, like Charlie's just being a purple unicorn. And he's like, so, he, so such an easy target to extort. And I think he's the talk of the prison. I really can see him being the talk of the prison and people on the outside looking up where the family lives and looking at the high rise and all that money. And I, I can see I can see Harvey being bumped for for money out on the street, leaving the condo. And he's asking about if they can use her book. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I would have brought more of her book out if I was George. I'd have brought out more details about dig she was doing on Dan and Tallahassee. Absolutely. I mean, she brought out some good nuggets, but there's more out there for the pickings.
Yeah, that is that would be real torture for Char Harvey. Sorry, Charlie, to be in solitary, no one there to to talk to. Yeah, Karen Reed case, I'm not following it close enough, but that seemed like it had had a lot of issues swirling around. Yeah, Jay says that when Charlie said he never ever dated one with kids, then he dates Katie, who has kids and a psycho ex, shows what he's really about. Well, I think that he would never date somebody like that. I think she's one in a million. I think she was used. The only reason he dated her because she said back in October, within a couple of weeks of them dating, she said that he asked her, "Would does he know anybody that can rough somebody up or words to that effect? effect and he she said yes and so by her saying yes that secured her the ability to continue dating charlie because she was just used to find somebody to be the hitman against dan markell so that's the only real purpose she was there i think if you talk to anybody that knew charlie i bet you that's the only person he ever dated that had kids not just one but two young kids so I just don't see him dating her. Granted, he he likes to date Asian women, but I think Asian women with kids were was definitely not in the equation for Charlie and his liking. And um, he has no regard for kids at the time. And certainly that's not somebody he looks at as a long-term partner. And so this is something that um that I think is the same thing with Jeff Lacasse. He was set up, he's not Wendy's type at all. And so he was used as to be the fall guy or the hitman, and he he didn't meet either of those criteria because he's not that kind of a guy. And so, but they they scored a home run with Katie, and uh, she did what she had to do to find the right guys to do the killing. And so that's why that's what that was about. So yeah, I, I, he, she he wasn't dating her; he was grooming her to be the uh, go between to find the hitman. So that's not really real dating. That's just a mutual use. And she was using him for, to try to get the rich and uh, fancy, swanky lifestyle. All right, just jumping ahead here. I'm at 11:11, uh, and we're 11:36. So I'm still a little bit behind. Kathy Brill is asking, "Do you think Donna will take a plea of Gen One?" I don't think she's gonna. I don't think she will because I think she's doesn't have that much time on this earth, and so I don't see her taking a plea. I think she wants to go for broke on this. So no, I don't see her cutting a plea. Zelda Fitzgerald's asking, would Wendy's interview with Ison be admissible as evidence? Yeah, in her trial, it would be admissible, definitely. How much of that, I'm not sure they would try to bring in, but I'd bring as much as I uh, as I could, and if, if the whole thing, if I had to. Hannah Day, now there's not a chance that they're going to keep co-conspirators in the same prison that just doesn't happen if it does happen it, it's uh an accident dereliction on the prisoner um in jail administration's part prison administration's part i should say Yeah, now Wendy, somebody's saying Wendy won't have to testify at her own trial, but that's why you bring perjury trials and you can bring all that other evidence she lied about and the other trials bring that in. And that, that way, basically, she is testifying in her own trial. And maybe she will take the stand in her own trial. That remains to be seen. Who knows? We'll never know, though, unless they charge her. So we, we need to see that charge happen first. Jill Jane, yeah, they do have more on Wendy because they have... They, 
state attorney even said you've, you guys have not seen all the evidence we have in this case. So there's there's some, there's more daggers out there against her. Maya Rodriguez is saying the uh, juror who voted to quit Katie said she felt when he was guilty. It's just ridiculous. She's not in jail right now. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. As 99.9% uh, .9 of the people following this case do. Ryan Prano is asking, why did the, you think that they paid him with a staple money? You think that they would be smarter than that? Well, you know, criminals make huge mistakes all the time. There's so many things to keep track of. You're trying to pull off the what they thought was a perfect murder, and there's just a lot of a lot of things they mess up, and they never thought they would have law enforcement come in their way. So that's part of the the arrogancy of it. Hearing some weird noise over there where the cats are. I just want to check it out. Zelda's asking, do you think the threat might have went down? A gang member said to him, hey, you got to pay me or else you're dead. That's apparently what it was about. You got to pay up and a threat on his life. So it wasn't just, hey, we're going to rough you up. It, I think there was a threat on his life. That's my understanding. Barbara Ellison's asking, well, since when there's a statute of limitation on murder charge? Well, for murder two, there is in Tennessee. And uh, so, yeah, that's uh, it's like 15 years. So I don't know if other states have that as well, but uh, yeah, this seems way too short. Yeah, I don't... Telltale saying Wendy's police interview was identical to that of the the Polito girl that was tried for murder for hire for her husband. Yeah, I, I recall hearing about that. Or she was crying when they said her husband had been shot and killed or something. And then, yeah, she was the one behind it all and hired the hitman and all that kind of stuff. So, Cindy Collins saying, having lived through Willie Meg's political reign here, Georgia Kaplan's hands were tied for years. Yeah, her hands are tied, and I've never accused Georgia of not being the one to go forward. It is a state attorney boss of hers, Jack Campbell, that took over in January of 2017, excuse me, 2016. And so I think he was, uh, as I've said before, I think he was tied in with Willie Meggs, and Willie Meggs was his protege and, and let him take the job to replace him. And so I think he has a automatic deference there. And so at least he's uh, climbing out of that, that hole that he put himself in of not doing the right thing soon enough. Yeah, the cats hang out with me when I when I do podcasting usually. Not all the time, but Patricia S is saying, I can't believe the state will bother charging Wendy with perjury. They're just going to they're just gonna go for a murder conviction. Agree. No, I don't agree. The reason why you want to bring perjury is so you can bring the other statements in to evidence. So I would want to bring in as much evidence I could from a previous three trial testimonies, especially the last one. I mean, there's so many gold nuggets in there that you'd want as a prosecutor. So I could care less if I get her convicted of perjury because I know if I bring that in, it's another further guarantee of her going down for murder one. So do I care about a conviction for, for perjury? I would have, I guess, if I thought I was going to lose on the other charges, but you bring in the perjury charges and you bring in her other statements and how she acted and you bring in videotape, that's just not a transcript, but you bring in actual videotape and play it in front of her jury. It's, um, it's, it'd, it'd have a, 
huge success in helping get her conviction. A conviction. Do you need it necessarily? No, but why do you leave a stone unturned? Those kind of details are critical. I go after every detail like that if I'm prosecuting or defending a case. And so the punishment for perjury, Jill, is in Florida, I know it makes a difference on whether you're, it's a, what kind of case it is. If it's on a murder case, it's, I think the punishment is like 20 or 30 years per count. So it's, it's a big size of chunk of time. Mealy is asking, do you think it's notable that Wendy only gave out out-of-state friends to ISOM during the interview while asking if he was still alive and if he was alone? Maybe she was afraid he could speak. Yeah, there's something odd about that. Her whole her whole interaction with ISOM is just very troubling, looks very odd. She doesn't have the kind of concern about him making it and all that kind of stuff. You just don't see any concern about hers, but you actually do pick up on the fact she's worried he's not, he's going to survive it more than anything. So yeah, it just looks very guilty. I do think Donna will testify, but ultimately it's her call. And unless her attorneys uh, advise her not to, I, th I think that she's going to want to testify. So <laughs> yeah so like i say it's a it's a large sentence yeah the movie version will be longer than lord of the rings yeah Maria Gabrielle saying nothing wrong circumstantial evidence no it's like evidence is evidence i don't really look at it whether you call it direct or circumstantial and all that kind of stuff because like i say circumstantial evidence often is way stronger than direct evidence it depends what kind you're talking about but evidence is evidence and if you get admissible and it's probative and it's indicative of guilt then use it and tito's asking is it possible when he's planning was to be the one that finds Stan's body. That's why she went to the scene. It could have been just curiosity. I don't know if she was necessarily looking for the body per se, but there's definitely something very, very much incriminating by her going over there. She was expecting, hoping to see something really horrific, right? There's no doubt in my mind. Lon Lit is asking, why won't Katie be really open of what she knows? Yeah, that's really a bizarre thing about this whole case that Katie has not just come right, more straightforward. But I think she's got some divided, twisted loyalty still, and I think that's what's holding her back. Katrina T is asking, when Wendy goes to trial, does it make any difference if her lawyer is John Laurel? I don't think, I don't care who her lawyer is. If I'm a prosecutor, she's going down. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. No lawyer is going to be able to package this case and, and make her out to be uh, having a case of reasonable doubt. So we're going on we're going on two hours now so i'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap it up here i'm going to look for one more question thanks for all your questions sorry i can't get to everyone's here 11 All right, Catalina, you're asking, 
if I can provide your analysis on Wendy getting sick at the celebratory dinner, consciousness of guilt, or was Wendy just drunk? Will Jeff testify at Donna's trial? Yeah, of course Jeff will testify. He's he's the, one of the star witnesses for this whole thing. I think Wendy about uh, that issue about her throwing up. I I don't I don't necessarily believe the, tr the whatever versions out there from her versus her brother Charlie. Charlie said she threw up in the bathroom. She said she threw up at the table. So, I mean, who knows? Who knows what? I I don't really I don't really know for sure. I just know that. I don't think for, there was any issue of her not eating for a couple of weeks, whether it's a couple of weeks or a couple of months. I know there's different time frames of when it was as well, how much after, what time frame after she got down there to Florida after Dan was murdered. But I think that, um, I think it might have been do had something to do with more her drinking. And so I do think that is something that, uh, she said she doesn't drink, but I think that there's ample evidence out there that she is a big drinker. So that's something that um, that I actually thought about bringing up in a future podcast to talk about why I think she's doing that. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. So thanks for everyone's support and just for Dan Markell's. And uh, it's been a tragic situation for them waiting so many years to have more Adelson's being prosecuted one at a time but they're they're wonderful people john and i have met them and they're just having the patience and, and graciousness about them and you really you really are drawn to them and what their plight has been and um they've just been so so much uh they've been re revealing so much strength through all this so you can't help but admire them and so with that thank you for your attention on this case and continuing to follow this case whether it's this channel or any other channel you follow i think it's all good in bringing justice for them and so with that i hope you guys have a safe and uh and wonderful weekend and, and i'm normally on sunday nights and i think i'm going to try to be on sunday night i'll be out in the country at my sister's assuming i get good connection there i'll probably be on seven or eight at night central time and um we'll go from there so take care and thank you